Hi, Dan. Hello, Megan. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to the end of this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year. Um, how about you? <laughs> Um, I, I confess to some mixed feelings um, in that, personally, it was actually a pretty good year in a whole variety of ways. Uh, it Such sucked as? For a, Share with the audience. Well, I mean, I, I, I said this in a, um, in a post, I think, and I also kind of implied it in a, in a marketplace commentary I did, that um, basically, as near as I can figure out, global political economy is a counter-cyclical profession. So, you know, if you, if you study the politics of the global economy when times are good, no one really cares about that. Uh, when times are really bad, however, suddenly, you know, everyone wants to hear your opinion, whether it's a good opinion or a bad one. Um, so, you know, I, hell, McKinsey called me this year to, to give a talk to their global strategy conference. You know, that doesn't normally happen. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so. I have to say it's actually been, for me, also uh, a surprisingly good year. Uh, my fiancé was laid off for six months, so that wasn't as much fun as it perhaps could have been. Uh, but other than that, it's actually been, um, you know, being a financial journalist right now, it's one of the most interesting times to be a business and economics journalist. So Right. I mean, you know, I think we both, unfortunately, and, and rather ironically, are living under the, the Maoist, you know, phrase, there is chaos under heaven and the situation is excellent for us. Yes, exactly. Um, um, you know, but, but I think I would as... trade that to have the situation not be quite so dire for so many other people. I have to say I would I feel the exact same way. I mean, you know, it's not like I was I, I don't feel any personal responsibility for the uh, the the various messes that we're in, but you know there is this sort of vampiric sense I have of I'm somehow profiting from it partly, and I, that makes me feel a little queasy, I guess. Well, let's start off by uh, we should actually just uh, I I think the uh, the theme for today is the the New Year's review of the year, but we realized as we were discussing this uh, that this should actually be the review of the decade. And before I right. go any further, I've just realized also that we should probably introduce ourselves. I'm Megan McArdle. I'm the Business and Economics Editor for The Atlantic. Um, I'm Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I also blog at Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, I should also add for, for uh, longtime viewers of our, our uh, the Blogging Heads Dialogues, there's another reason why we're doing this, which is Bob Wright basically told us that as some of the original Blogging Heads People, you know, if we didn't do a dialogue this year, which we had not been, which is just a crime, um, you know, they were worried that in some ways the world could even be worse in 2010. You know, that 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 you know, this is this would be one of the harbingers of that stupid 2012 movie actually coming to fruition. Right after this, Dan is actually going to walk out into his backyard and pull a sword out of a stone, hopefully setting us up for a better year, <laughs> better decade to come. <laughs> exactly, um, and also I apologize. This. Uh, this is a slightly different view for people long accustomed to my normal background of a uh, a chair. I, I have a new hardware system, and so I'm actually talking to a webcam. So we'll see how this works. Hopefully well, and will work. and viewers will be getting a new background for me because inexplicably our spotlights have started showing up on my camera. So you're now getting the exciting McCardle Suderman um, back window uh, plantation shutter instead. <laughs> That's very good. All right, let's get right into this. So, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, it, it's both the end of the year and the end of the decade. And I have to say, I think the end of the decade for me has been somewhat anticlimactic, perhaps partly because first it, it kind of snuck up on me. But second, you know, the last time we did this, it was not just the end of the year. Or it was just or not just the end of the decade. It was the end of the century, the end of the millennium, yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, somehow just the decade in and of itself doesn't seem like that big of a deal. I think for me it does because my life has been so totally upended by the events of the decade. I mean, 10 years ago, I was in the middle of my first year of business school. I was preparing to celebrate the millennium in the cold, cold, icy streets of Chicago. Uh, you know, you 10 years ago, yeah, we were, were actually at living... The same time. Exactly, yeah. 10 years ago, I still remember what we did the last day of 1999. Um, Erica was pregnant with Sam then, and uh, we took a nice walk to the point, you know, right by on the end of 57th Street, uh, um, uh, right off the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, you know, the, the point right on the lake. Um, mm -hmm. you, you get a nice view of the downtown then. And it was it was incredibly warm 10 years ago today in Chicago. I remember that because all we did was wear fleeces. Uh, I was wearing a, believe it or not, uh, a hand-me-down fur coat because I was freezing. I don't know what sort of polar bears your family are, but... Uh... Me. It was like 45 or 50. I remember that day because it was incredibly warm. God, yes. But I watched well, the all... fireworks on the bridge over the uh, over the river, one of the bridges ah. over the river in Chicago. And uh, it was extremely romantic. But, at, you know, now when I think about what I was expecting to do, I was 
prepping up for my first round of interviews with an investment bank. I ultimately actually spent my summer with Merrill Lynch. And mm -hmm. I expected to be an investment banker or a, uh, a management consultant. I should be, you know, living in my palatial home in the suburbs somewhere with uh, my 2.6 children and my dog and my nanny. Um, and instead, I ended up, you know, as I ended up becoming a journalist, first becoming a blogger and then becoming a journalist. I ended up working down at the World Trade Center and Disaster Recovery Site for a year. Um, and I'm doing basically nothing that I plan to do. It's actually, I'm very happy with what I'm doing. I like what I'm doing more than I plan what I plan to. But I think of it as before, as before 2001, I was on a certain fairly conventional track for educated professionals. And after 2001, I just completely fell off of it and uh, sort of struck out into the unknown. So it's, uh, it's been a big decade. I got, you know, I got engaged this year. I'm, uh, I we're hopefully will eventually buy houses and things, but it's, it's not the same as what I expected. So uh, I feel like it's been a, a pretty transformative decade, not just for me, but also for the world. If you think what yeah. we thought about the world in 1999, after 9-11, nothing, to me, I, I still think that in the same way that Pearl Harbor robbed America of a certain innocence, the events of 9-11 just changed the country and the world that we live in fairly significantly and I think fairly permanently. But you're, you're the political science expert, so maybe you have a different uh, impression of that. I mean, I, I think there's, obviously, you know, 9-11, you know, it's left a scar and it's not going to go away. And unfortunately, I mean, let's face it, the way people have reacted to the, the Nigerian uh, uh, bombers attempt to blow up a plane in Detroit suggests the ways in which the world actually has changed. Um, and also some of these slightly vexing ways in which the world has yet to change. Um, but the fact that we're sort of going through this all over again of the how did, we, you know, something slip through the cracks and, you know, what's going on and do we still have to fear al-Qaeda? It is odd that it sort of ends... The decade ends in that same kind of fear of terrorism the same way. In terms of sort of signal events, for me, um, I, I, I think you have to go with the rise of China. And it's the 2008 financial crisis for me. Um, you know, that's mostly because I study the politics of the global economy. 9-11 was significant in a variety of ways, and I don't mean to diminish it. But, um, you know, if, if you want to talk about things like, you know, sort of macro distribution of power things, the 2008 crisis was in some ways the, the real sort of wake-up call for um, the ways in which certain unsustainable trends became actually, in the end, unsustainable. Um, uh, it's remarkable that if you think about it, for the entire decade of of, of the noughts, you know, there were, you had various people saying you can't run that huge of a trade deficit, and China can't keep you know amassing that large uh, amount of foreign exchange reserves. Something's going to happen, and the way in which things happen, and like, happened it, in, in such a way that anyone predicted, but but still, you actually have have had a, a crisis that's causing everyone to rethink the way the world should actually work. And, you know, that's pretty unusual. I have to say that one of the things that has been driving me nuts for the last year is the number of people who sort of solemnly written about how, why, why didn't the financial journalists see this problem coming? Um, mm -hmm. And then they'll point to some other random person who apparently did see it coming. And the right. irritating thing is that, of course, like I've been writing about the housing bubble since 2003 or 2004, I was writing about the global trade imbalances since 2003, 2004. Um, I was writing that this was probably not going to end well, although I didn't see the particular way in which it was going to end badly. But then I'm joined with, by, in this by people like Paul Krugman and Noriel Rubini, who keep getting pointed out to me as these incredibly prescient people who saw something coming that other people didn't. And the fact is that, that I think that all of these uh, pressures we're building up over the whole decade, um, and we saw the pressures being bad, but we didn't see just how catastrophic the release. Um, I, I think of it sort of as like living in an earthquake zone, and you know, you know that earthquakes come every so often. You know, maybe the conditions that make earthquakes more likely, um, but you know, sometimes you get a, a magnitude three, and sometimes you get a magnitude eight, um, and I think everyone gets taken by surprise when the bigger ones happen. The way I would put it, the, the metaphor I'll use is a plumbing one, um, which is I think everyone knew that there was pressure building in a pipe and that the pipe was only built to take so much. What I don't think anyone quite anticipated was where was the pipe going to burst, and that mattered because where it burst was you know, going to affect uh, uh, how wide the damage was. Well, um, let's talk about uh, the global financial crisis. It sounds like you and I are both 
endorsing uh, what Ben Bernanke called the global savings glut theory of uh, of what happened to America mm-hmm. over the last uh, over the last ten years. I certainly do think that this was a major component. And for viewers who maybe weren't following along at home, the basic idea is that you had Asian savers and particularly Asian central banks who were pouring massive amounts of capital into the United States. There are a bunch of different theories about why this was happening. Uh, Part of it was that Asian central banks wanted to build up currency reserves against a replay of the 1998 crisis, especially because they felt that the the IMF had mishandled their economic problems. Um, Mm -hmm. You had China, which was trying to keep its exports artificially cheap, which meant that it had to devalue its currency. And the way it did that was to buy dollars with its currency, which, of course, pushed up the price of dollars, pushed down the price of its own currency, but then it had all these dollars it had to park somewhere. And then you had Asian savers who just, independently of everything else, they wanted what they thought of as a safe place to park their savings, and the United States has traditionally been, our debt is the risk-free rate, we are the safe haven. And so those three things came together and resulted in an enormous capital inflow into the United States. And it all went into, mostly went into our debt markets. Um, And that just pushed down the price of credit to practically nothing. So what you got was an enormous amount of stupid money that was willing to do things like lend money to idiots who wanted to buy houses that they couldn't possibly afford under normal conditions. I remember actually seeing in, I think, 2006, the Washington Post had a letter from someone whose basic plan was to buy a house and live in it for two years not have a job or anything, but then sell it. And that two years worth of house appreciation was going to be their income. Right. And yeah. you, know, you thought, how did anyone think that this was going to work as a, you know, because when you extrapolate this out to the rest of society, it's pretty obvious that we can't all make income by living in houses. But that didn't seem to occur to a large number of people that this wasn't sustainable. Um, what's your take? Um, well, I mean, my take is, I, I think, look, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic, small c on this, which is I think there were a number of causes that that I should say this. yes, I, I I agree with that. So I, I think I think without question that was one of the underlying structural causes, which is there was a, an inflow of capital which made you know which led to a, a fair amount of asset price inflation, um, and and as a result it, it affected a lot of, uh, of people's behaviors. I think you have to add on to that obviously to some extent, you know the inability to quite understand uh, you know how uh, financial innovation was going to lead to a buildup of systemic risk. I don't think anyone saw that coming. Um, so that was uh, you know sort of a second front. I think a third front is sort of the 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 ideas that built up. And I mean, I'm curious. I don't know if we've ever talked about Justin Fox's book, um, The Myth of the Rational Market. Um, but I, I actually like that book in terms of talking about how efficient markets theory sort of evolved over time to the point where, you know, it was almost a caricature of itself, where, where the sort of extreme hard version of it was the price of any, you know, the, 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 the price of an asset represents all available information about that asset, um, which is not necessarily always the way the world works. And I think the final component, and I think this is the one that everyone's going to forget, um, is just the political economy of bubbles themselves, which is it is very easy to say ex post, hey, we're in a bubble and, you know, back in 2003, you shouldn't have cut interest rates so low. And in 2005, you should have cracked down a little bit on the mortgage market and so on and so forth. Um, I remember when these debates happened at the time, and everyone was praising Alan Greenspan back in 2001 to 2003 for keeping interest rates so low. And a lot of people in 2005 said, the last thing you want to do is pop this bubble, because that's what's fueling the economy right now. Um, and so one of the, the, the problems with the way I think bubbles work is that you actually begin to believe it's the new normal and that um, it is very difficult for people to come in and provide the counterfactual of, look, we have to act now because if we don't, there will be a catastrophic accident. And, of course, how do you prove that? Well, but I also Um, think that the problem is that by the time it's actually obvious that it's a bubble, and that I I, I would say that was in 2005, is the point at which you could unequivocally say this is not merely, you know, house prices do have abnormal runs of a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, and sometimes for justifiable reasons. I mean, there, there were good reasons for why capital was rushing into the United States, you could argue, in the late 90s and early part of this decade. Exactly. So what you have is, by the time it's unequivocally a bubble, it's 2005, and popping yeah. it would have required this absolutely traumatic um, interest rate increase. And one of the things that, that people forget, interestingly, you see this capital flow into the United States right before the stock market bubble crashed. 
um, mm-hmm. for a lot of tedious reasons having to do with World War II, World War One, and exchange rates and um, a bunch of other things I won't go into. The net effect was that the United States was the recipient of a great deal of gold from Europe. And yeah. what happens is that the Fed actually did try to pop the bubble. People have forgotten about this, largely. And that Americans. led to the Great Depression. Right. No, yeah. no, actually, that's not true. What happened, okay. they, tried to, they doubled the interest rate on margin loans. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's doubled. Um, I don't, I, it, it's been a little while since I looked at this, but they, they sharply increased the interest rate yeah. on uh, margin loans. And all it did was attract more capital because now margin loans were even more profitable. <laughs> So it, it, it did temporarily, but there was a second, if, if memory serves, and you know, I'm drawing from my memory of reading the, the, the Lords of Finance earlier this year, there was a second effort to then um, prick the bubble, and that actually worked remarkably well, and of course it worked so well that the, the market crashed. Right, that was, that was the, they, then they, they increased interest rates, and then the market right. crashed. But so what, yeah. what you see is, first of all, that raising interest rates doesn't always work, and second yeah. of all, that when it does work, you can have catastrophic results, and there's other it can issues work too well. with what was going on with the Fed at that time. But at any rate, that by the time you you can definitely say it's a bubble, and I'm not just going to be gratuitously throwing a bunch of people out of work because what all of the people who are now, especially on the left, it's totally weird to me. They're both really, really angry because the Fed is worried about inflation and won't inflate yeah. the currency enough to keep jobs right, but they are also really, really angry at Alan Greenspan. Uh, and then Ben Bernanke for not having popped this thing. Well, the actual right. action that would have done that would have been to throw millions of people out of work. Um, because that's how you pop a bubble. You raise interest rates enough to sort of, you know, and I, I've talked to a bunch of people, including people who are now, I won't name names, but now um, advisors to the Obama administration. Um, Ooh. I haven't uh-huh. gotten any of them to tell me that they think uh, that we should target asset prices. At, yeah. at the Fed, because it really is, it's dangerous and incredibly hard to do. And if mm-hmm. and if the Fed already has a very difficult mandate to carry out, if you add another thing to it, um, first of all, you erode the ability to carry out the mandate they already have. And second of all, um, because asset prices swing, they have runs, they have busts, it's not always obvious when you're in a bubble that's like bad for the economy versus one that's pretty... If you think about the tech bubble, it was bad when it popped, but it actually didn't do that much to the economy, and not merely because we had a housing bubble to replace it. It just it wasn't that and catastrophic. I, right, and I think that's also one of the things that probably governed wh- you know how Greenspan and Bernanke acted later on. Was their attitude was, look at the tech bubble, that wasn't a huge you know systemic effect on the economy. So why do we want to you know intervene now? Everyone thought they'd become geniuses, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and, and you know, you, it, uh, you know, there's the fiscal side of this equation as well, which is, you know, Paul Krugman in the early part of this decade was uh, bitching and moaning about the size of deficits, um, you know, post tax cut, post uh, uh, expansion of, of uh, Medicaid benefits, and so on and so forth. And now he's on the other side saying, no, 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 we we need to spend even more, more, more. Um, you know, acknowledging that in fact he was an error apparently early in the earlier part no, of this decade. No, you know, it, it, it's different. Dan Bush was in in, in the president. It's, ah, it's okay. completely different. Um, I, I um, actually don't know how you could make that kind of mistake. <laughs> um, well, this, I mean, this leads to, the, I guess, the, the foreign policy sort of questions about the, the decade. And I think, um, you, know, you know, it's funny. I mean, everyone obviously will focus on the, the transition from Bush to Obama. But I actually think the biggest um, sort of reversal of course was the uh, was probably around the time of, of Bush's second term, which is, I think you can argue that by the end of the first term, even Bush himself had sort of realized that the neoconservative uh, approach to foreign policy had worn itself out. And either by circumstances or by an actual change of mind, you know, there actually has been a fair amount of continuity, I think, between Obama's foreign policy and Bush's foreign policy. But there was a dramatic difference between Bush's foreign policy of 2003 and Bush's foreign policy of 2008. So elaborate on that a little bit, because I, I find this, I think that... Um not just the neocons. My, my whole theory of what happened in 2003 is that um, a lot of us got the United States confused with Israel um, and not in the, uh, the, the crypto anti-Semitic way that uh, that sounds. Um, that terrorism for Israel is an ex- existential threat. Right. You know, this is something where it actually can bring down the country. Yeah. It's not an existential threat for the United States, but the only model we really had was Israel. And so we kind of acted like 
what Israel would act like if Israel mm-hmm. had an enormous army um, and were not surrounded by massive hostile states that have larger populations than they do. Um, and I, you know, and by the time we realized that, you know, that wasn't a good model, and in fact, Israel wouldn't act like that because it's not a very efficient way to try to deal with terrorism, it was too late. We'd already done a, a phenomenal amount of damage. Um, but you may, you may have a different take on that than I do. I think my take, I mean, I agree with you, which is why actually I, I, I disagreed with you a, a couple minutes ago about 9-11 being the signal moment. I mean, I think in some ways 9-11 was significant, you know, in terms of affecting the American psyche, but it wasn't a systemic, you know, I mean, it, it didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't an existential threat. Um, to the United States. And I think part of the problem, and I agree with you, was that, you know, with the national security strategy in 2002 and after that, it was treated as a, as an existential threat. The notion that terrorism plus weapons of mass destruction equals existential threat. Um, and so, you know, I mean, let's face it, I think, I think the, I think you would argue, and this is probably where I disagree with a fair number of, of foreign policy commentators, is that 9-11 led to some of the instances, led to a, a political situation where the invasion of Iraq was possible. And I think without 9-11, that doesn't happen, um, no matter how much, uh, you know, arguments might be made about the power of the Israel lobby or what have you. Um, and I think as a result of, of the way in which the Iraq invasion went, um, we're not going to see a replay of those sorts of circumstances. I mean, everyone got very bent out of shape, for example, about a week ago. I don't know if you saw this Alan Cooperman op-ed in the New York Times, uh, making the case for military action against Iran. Mm-hmm. I, I have it, you know, but I'm, 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 I'm sorry. That sounded like I was implying that I had read it. I have not seen it, but I've, uh, I've heard similar arguments from other people. Right. And what was interesting to me in the foreign policy blogosphere was that, you know, a whole bunch of people sort of geared up and said, oh, no, you know, here we go again. They're cranking up, you know, for a, a uh, propaganda campaign to, to launch an attack on Iran. And the concern about that might actually be well-placed. I just think that, you know, the, the neoconservative echo chamber is a little bit quieter than – it doesn't quite have the same uh, size of amplifiers that it used to, um, in no small part because you've got different people in the executive branch and you have different people in the legislative branch. And also because we've moved down the learning curve, which is to say maybe invading a country is not always the best way to deal with it. Um, I might even go further than you and say that after 9-11, yeah. the invasion of Iraq was not merely possible, but possibly inevitable, that – that we were in a mood to pick up uh, in, in, I can't remember who I, I someone wrote an op-ed early in the decade saying every every 10 years or so, America has to pick up a small country and throw it against the wall. Uh, I think that's Max it. Boot. I want to say that was Max Boot, but I won't swear to that. Um, but, I mean, I, I think that we were. I, I, I share, I, I, I indict myself, but I indict most other Americans. The Iraq War was phenomenally popular for a reason, which is that we wanted to do something military. In response to in response to nine eleven, and had we not had Bush not been president, I'm not even sure we would have had Gore been president. I'm not sure that we wouldn't have invaded Iraq or some other country uh, in order to show the world that we were really serious. Um, I, I have to say, I disagree with that. I think if Gore had been president, we would have invaded Afghanistan. I don't have any doubt about that. I think it probably would have stopped at Afghanistan. I think I think the answer that the Gore administration would have given is, well, we've invaded a country that you know from which the, the came the source of the attacks. We don't need to invade another country. Um, I, I think I agree with you, however, that the mood was ripe in the country such that if you wanted to invade another country, particularly in the Middle East, you could. And that's what the Bush administration, I think, took advantage of. Um, I'm not sure reason- about that. I think that they, cap- really? they, they took advantage of it. But I also think that there was a feeling, maybe, you know, it's, it's a long time ago, maybe I'm misremembering, but I, I think that there was a feeling after Afghanistan that we hadn't done enough. Right, that we still needed to do something big. Afghanistan was not, given the scale of the United States military, big. Um, mm. And I think that there was a hunger for some sort of action, some sort of really serious hardcore action. I think it was obviously, in retrospect, incredibly stupid action. Um, mm. I certainly wouldn't support anything like it again. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, it was obviously with Gore in office less likely, but I don't know yeah. how, I don't know if that probability falls below 50%. Um, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's counterfactuals it's, are difficult. Yeah, this is always a difficult counterfactual. I, I don't think it would have, I honestly don't think it would have happened. But again, it's striking that, you know, I, I always remember this, uh, um, proving once again that Paul Kennedy is one of the world's leading anti-predictors. 
Um, I remember he wrote an op-ed for the Financial Times at the end of 2002 or the end of 2001 saying, you know, the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world, and it's also the most powerful country in the history of the world. That you, He'd never seen anything like it. The, the, get, the disparity and the gap in power between the United States and the next country, you know, is massive, and, and this is the fact, you know, that we have to deal with. And, well, that didn't last terribly long. I mean, the U.S. is still the most powerful country in the world, and I think uh, far too many people have... have sort of been ready to bury the United States prematurely. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure you saw this Pew poll that came out uh, last month showing that um, a plurality of Americans actually believe that China is now the world's largest economy, even though they're not remotely close to being the world's largest economy. Um, but that says more about the el- economic illiteracy of Americans than anything else. They may be responding to the fact that they're now the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, um, which yes. seems correlated in people's minds with, with having a gigantic economy. Um, Pollution is power. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, that, that, that might have something to do with it. Um, but it, it's telling how – it's not whether or not the actual power realities have changed. What's, I think, fascinating is that the perception has changed so dramatically and swung, you know, from a situation in 2002 where the belief was the U.S. is the world's greatest power in the history of the world to a perception now where we're not even the number one country anymore. Um, and I don't think either – Perception is necessarily accurate, but it is, it's dramatic. It, it's interesting to me how wide the pendulum has swung. How long until China is in a position where there are serious military threat to the United States, not just to regional strategic interests, but um, where you mean on a global scale? Yeah, well, it, to one where they could go around doing serious harm. I mean, right? There's some there's some extent to which China we could at least from what I understand, we could beat China in a one-to-one military match. They can do anything that doesn't matter to us enough to expend the force necessary to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. But they're constrained by the fact that if we decided to invade China, we could. It might end up like Iraq, etc., but, like, we could dismantle the Chinese government and make it go away. Um, Well... I'm not sure. Let me put it this way: If there was, let's say, a proxy war over Taiwan, I'd, I don't. I mean, it would. It would. I, I really don't even want to speculate on how that would would go. But um, but, but, I mean, but yes, but I mean, right the now the U.S. military Taiwan isn't an existential issue for us, so we would yeah. never commit all of our force. But if it were a World War II, so it is for China, I would have right. Yeah. But if it were yeah. a World War II like situation, the U.S. would pretty clearly emerge the victor of that. Probably, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. How long until that's not the case? Is it ever going to be not the case that you know that the is the United? How long is the United States going to stay the world's you know just overwhelmingly dominant military power? Well, this is one of the sort of interesting long-term questions because the U.S. has such a tremendous military advantage right now, both in terms of its technology and in terms of the sophistication of its armed forces and the amount of money it puts into the military. That um, that you know China's got a long way to catch up. Um, that said, they're starting to actually invest serious uh, amounts of dollars. And the, the, the really interesting question is, at what point do the various budgetary, you know, sort of hard budget constraints that the United States has affect its ability to project power overseas? Um, and that's going to be an interesting question this coming decade. Um, so my guess is, is that, uh, you know, 10 years from now, when we have the same dialogue, you know, besides the fact that you're still going to look spectacular, it, that will be another thing that will, will you know, will come up. Um, the the extent to which China's military is now a serious rival to the American military. So we've graded uh, we've graded the Bush administration in the last ten years. Let's grade uh, the Obama administration in the la- on a, the first year in office. Um, what's your take? How has he done so um, far? You know, I would. I think in terms of su- I think you have to grade on substance and you have to grade on politics. Um, on politics, I'd probably give him a C. Um, I don't think he's done a, a terribly good job, um, you know, in, in that he doesn't do – the Obama administration does not win a lot of news cycles, I don't think. Um, I think Andrew Sullivan actually had a, had a fair post about this, pointing out that, that very often they don't win the news cycle, but they might actually win the, the sort of strategic goals of what they're trying to implement. Um, I think on policy I – mean, are we talking just foreign policy or overall? Because I don't want to talk I mean, about like, let, Let's talk about the ver- – let's, let's think about what the, the major areas are, right? There's health care. There's the financial yeah. crisis. There is Afghanistan. Um, there's other foreign policy issues we can stick in a basket, right. uh, and then maybe other, you know, economic issues. Um, so start, starting with uh, 
with Afghanistan, actually, because um, I don't know anything about this, and I don't have enough expertise to form an opinion on how they've done, but uh, you do and should. Yeah, I mean, on Afghanistan, Afghanistan, I would probably give him his worst grade. I would probably give him maybe a C plus. Um, in the sense of, it's, I'm not entirely convinced that the uh, the policy they're pursuing is the right one. Um, you know, the, the idea to expand uh, the number of troops. I think part of this is, what is the mission supposed to be in Afghanistan? Is it supposed to be to set up an appropriate state, or is it supposed to be to prevent al-Qaeda from uh, setting up their base of operations? And I think you can potentially argue that, you know, the past month's worth of events suggests that um, the main locus of al-Qaeda activity directed at the United States is not going to be coming from Afghanistan anymore. Um, now, that said, this might actually be a situation where I really do think the politics trump the substance of the policy. I think what Obama is doing is trying to basically do a, a version of what happened in Somalia in 1993 writ large, which is expand first and then withdraw, um, with the idea that by expanding first, it covers the fact that in the end, you're going to see a drawdown of troops. Um, so we'll see what happens in the, in the next year. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I had no problem with the amount of deliberation he took to it. I mean, there was a period where people were, were critiquing him for taking so long to decide. I didn't have a problem with that. Um, what's your take on this? Um, I think that I, 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 you know, ultimately I'm, I'm going to pass. I think Iraq was the last okay. major foreign uh, policy issue on which I had an opinion. It turned out to be a very bad and stupid opinion. And so I have, uh, I've decided that, Given that I can only sort of master so many topics, uh, or at least in my own head, I'm sure my critics would say I've mastered none. Um, but you know, I only have so much attention and uh, and expertise to spread around. And I I think that the optics of it mm -hmm. um, are okay. Uh, but I don't know. I sort of fear that we're just going to end up straggling along there because. Especially now, I think the interesting thing about Detroit is that I think that's actually probably going to change a lot of how Obama does things. And this is what I was kind yeah. of saying about things being inevitable. I think Obama yeah. was in a much better position to withdraw three weeks ago than he is now. I think it's going to be because, and you know, I, I don't know if you've seen... Oh, I'm not so sure about that, actually, because I, you can actually make the opposite case. The opposite case being, why is Obama devoted so much attention to Afghanistan when it's clear that the, this came from Yemen? From a different from a different part of the, uh, the globe, I can see someone. Let me put it this way: one of Obama's criticisms during the 2008 campaign was that the Bush administration erred in invading Iraq because by doing so, resources that should have been devoted to Afghanistan were reallocated to a to a different theater, and in the end, it turned out a, a you know one that was not necessary. On the other hand, you know you could argue that someone's going to make the same criticism of Obama. Why is he amping up? The, the, you know, the, the tempo of operations in Afghanistan if it turns out that we should actually be focusing on different areas of the globe? I think the reason I say this is, I mean, what you're saying is entirely logical. However, okay. uh, I hew to Tyler Cowen's what he called the angry ape theory of politics, which is that we want to see an angry ape beating his chest and screaming um, and telling the world that we're really tough. And I'm yeah. not even trivializing it. There really is this hunger to see Obama acting powerful. And so it's been interesting to me that there have been a lot of op-eds that have been complaining that, you know, the Democrats didn't make an issue out of Richard Reid. Why are there now Republicans making an issue out of this guy? And I right. think there's a couple answers to that. The first is that, um, you know, it's a couple of Republicans. It isn't the Republican Party writ large, as far as I can tell. But the larger answer is that, look, George Bush, it, it, it was a few months after 9-11, um, mm -hmm. George Bush was seen as doing everything he could, right? He was seen as being tough and toughening up our yeah. security. And Obama ran on not being so tough, right? Like that, that was essentially his platform. Be nicer to the people of Guantanamo, be nicer. And I'm yeah. not disagreeing with that policy, but that is your, if that then but the optics of it look bad now, then you are mm -hmm. going to get blamed for not being tough enough. Um, and George right. Bush, whatever else you could say about him, he was not going to get blamed for not being tough enough, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that now Barack Obama just has to project being tough and not, mm -hmm. you know, not backing down in the face of terrorism, even if it's a strategically bad decision. Um, and, you know, you can say he should be courageous, but he doesn't have that much political capital left to go be courageous. Mm -hmm. um, I think he has, I, I will say on the politics, I give him a bad grade. He squandered just 
an amazing amount of political capital, he and the Democrats. And mm-hmm. they are, they have done it over and over again. I think they're preparing to do it again with this jobs bill. They're under the impression that spending $170 billion on jobs is going to make them more popular. It's going to make them less popular. It's going to make yeah. these people are sick of Democrats spending a ton of money. Um, so going and spending more money and saying it's about jobs, well, they said all the other money they spent was about jobs. And Which everyone's I have angry to say, about it. I have to say what's truly depressing about this is that it's not like the Republicans – it amazes me that the Republican Party in 2009 actually had a decent political year, um, given the sort of content of the ideas they were putting forward. Oh, I, I was having a conversation with a, an analyst, a, a libertarian think tank, a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago about health care. And we were talking about the fact that at this point, whatever the Democrats do, um, they're in trouble. And I, mm-hmm. that I think that it's very likely that if health care reform passes, as it now looks likely to, despite my prediction three weeks ago on Blogging Heads that it wouldn't, <laughs> that they're, I think they're going to lose the House if they pass it. Um, hmm. And because it's, I mean, look at what's happening to Ben Nelson. The, the deal he cut on Medicaid mm-hmm. only is only popular with 17% of people in Nebraska. Yeah. The other 83% are angry at him for doing it. Um, and it's worse outside. So I think that you look at those people and you think, yeah, they're going to lose seats in the Senate. They're probably going to lose the House. Um, but then we were both talking and I suddenly said, oh my God, the Republicans can't come into power. They're not ready. They don't have any ideas. They're not ready to lead. They don't like, that would be terrible if they no. got more. I'm okay with them retaking the house. I like divided government, but anything more than that, like they, they have no policy agenda. Their entire policy agenda is that they hate people who live in cities. Um, <laughs> and like, that, you, that's not a workable platform. Um, we can't all move. We have housing investments and jobs and things. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I think that this is, it's amazing. But at the same time, I actually predicted this. I was predicting this in 2008. I I said, it's not clear to me why anyone would want this job. Whoever takes it Mm -hmm. has a very good chance of being incredibly unpopular, as indeed Obama has taken a huge popularity lead and is now the least popular first-term president since Gallup started polling, which is just extraordinary. But, you know, my friends it, during at, with the election were twittering, it's 1932, it's 1932. And as I said at the time, it's not. It's 1929. You've still got mm. several years of miserable of financial crisis misery to run. And it just, these things do have to run themselves out. You can't just turn everything on a dime with stimulus. Stimulus takes 18 months to work its way through the economy. Um, right. Probably. Although that could things will fix by 2012, but it's not by no means guaranteed. Barack Obama may lose simply because he had the misfortune to be president at the wrong time. I'm not entirely sure about that. It would not surprise me if you saw a replay of, let's say, what happened in in, uh, the first term of the the Clinton administration, which is, even if they lose the House, um, you know, the problem is that the the moment the Republicans take over something, they're actually going to be expected to govern rather than, you know, throw crap at people. And so... um, and, and furthermore, I think one of the, the interesting things that will happen is in, in 2012 is, yes, there might be, I mean, it might be the point where Obama is just unpopular and that, that becomes the issue. But, of course, it's going to be Obama versus someone else. And the question is going to be who the other person is going to be and whether or not, you know, they, you know you can all at all picture them as, as president. So it's an interesting question. I mean, you know. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that if, if unemployment drags along above 10 percent into 2011, yeah. It's nothing to do with Barack Obama or any yeah. manifestation of political skill. I think anyone who is president with that kind He's of be in trouble on unemployment is just going to end up being in trouble. It's nothing no, to do with him or his opponent. Um, that's a but fair yeah, point. I mean, yeah. the, 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 the Democrats had the misfortune to win too big. They now own it, right? There's there And their complaints, even to you know people like my mother, who's a swing voter, um, you know, they're just whining. They've got 60 in the mm-hmm. Senate. They've got an overwhelming majority in the House. Um, mm-hmm. And they're just complaining about the Republicans. Well, come on, guys. Seriously? <laughs> you have a filibuster-proof majority and a majority in the House and the presidency, and you can't pass any legislation except the porculus? Well, this, this raises an interesting question, which is, I mean, from the, the Democrats' perspective, I would assume that Obama would be willing to trade off the health care reform bill for losing the House. In the, you know, in the sense of the health care reform bill, you know, I, I haven't paid, I've paid almost no attention to this debate. Um, I, I, and I have to confess to, to Blogging Heads viewers, I think I've said this on the blog at some point, health care is my Achilles heel. It's not an issue that I, I have ever really um, bothered to invest any knowledge in whatsoever. 
um, because I can't maintain any focus. I, and I grant this is a complete and utter character flaw in myself, and I apologize profusely for it. But, you know, from what I understand, it's supposed to be a pretty big reform package. Um, you know, the biggest sort of uh, uh, kind of legislation of its kind since the Great Society programs. Wouldn't this be a case where, if you're the Democrats, you'll take that trade off? That, well, you know, this is one of those instances where it's good to implement something, even if it, it comes at a political cost. But here's the problem it's not a parliamentary system, right? I'm totally yeah. sure that Harry Reid is willing to tra- trade Ben Nelson's seat for doing health care. I'm just <laughs> not sure Ben Nelson is. And right. that's what's in the House. They're all up for re-election. And there's a lot of them in conservative districts where this has been hugely unpopular and they're getting an earful. Every, and every time, every time this health care bill gets debated, it goes down a few points in popularity. Um, Except now the Democrats have truly, you know, well and buried themselves because even if it becomes more unpopular now, how popular do you think they're going to be if the bill doesn't pass? But the Democrat, the Democratic individual members can vote against it. Yeah. Like that's yeah. the, this but is I'm the problem. The, it's not that it, it's not like a parliamentary system where you're running right, a party, right. right? Like this guy can still win even if his party loses, and that's that's possible. But I'm not sure that's. I mean, this, I, this you want to talk about you know de- trends over the decade. This is another trend of the decade, which is not that we become a parliamentary system, but you can argue that the the ideological cohesion of both parties has become much more strengthened over the past ten years. I don't think that's uh, I mean, true of the Democrats. I think it's definitely true of the Republicans. But the Democrats got into office by electing a bunch of really conservative people to um, conservative seats. And they don't, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a reason that their their pro-life caucus in, in the House is just refusing to go along with the leadership. And that's that they live in heavily pro-life districts that don't want them to. Right. Um, so, I mean, I actually, like, the Republicans have demonstrated extraordinary party discipline. The fact that there mm-hmm. are only two senators who are even willing to talk to the other side um, yeah. And that no one in the house, that's, that's amazing, right? But yeah. it's also because they got a No, there was one, well, no, no, they did, they did have one Republican vote for the bill, remember? Right, no, they got the, they had the one guy in, uh, in Louisiana, in Louisiana. he's voting against the final bill, as far as I can Oh, tell. is he? He's I didn't know that. Vote, oh, okay. uh, that. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that he's not going to vote for the final bill. He only voted for the, the house version, um, mm-hmm. and got a lot of crap in his district, and now is probably not going to vote for the final one. Um, interesting. Okay. But but even, you know, to have only one defector in the House and two defect- yeah. potential defectors in the Senate, and ultimately it looks like neither of them is going to end up defecting. It looks like they're going to have to right. do it on a party line vote. Um, but in part, that's because they're a really small party right now, and they don't have that many yeah. members, and their members are from their most conservative districts. And the Democrats right. have the same kind of party discipline when they didn't have that many members. But, mm-hmm. you know, as I, I think the big middle is still the big middle. It's just that um, it got hidden for a while. And I have to say, yes, on health care, the Democrats have had extraordinary party discipline. It's totally unclear to me why any of the members from the swing districts are willing to do this, because it almost certainly means losing their street, their seats. Um, and I'm probably more pessimistic about their chances, but I don't think that passing – this is – I mean, the, the logic of it. Their logic is if they pass it, Obama will get a bump, and then mm-hmm. that will help them in, in 2010 and 2012. But, mm-hmm. you know, when you think about it in terms of another bill, if the Republicans had managed to pass Social Security reform on a straight party line vote, which was, you know, maybe a little less popular than this, maybe about the same, depending on the polls you look at, would that mm-hmm. really have made their electoral chances better in 2006? I don't think so. I think it would have made them worse. Passing mm-hmm. something that two thirds of the country is against, or in this case, 55 percent of the country is against this bill. Mm-hmm. So passing something that 55 percent of the country country is against, um, and growing, every time you debate it, you, you lose more people. How is that going to set you up? I mean, you haven't proven that you're legislatively effective. You've proven that you don't care what your constituents think. And that's not well, usually a key to electoral success. I would, I would say the following on this, which is, and this actually goes back to the sort of, you know, big events of the decade, and there's one which we haven't mentioned yet, which is Katrina. Um, I think you can actually argue that, that it, what's fascinating to me is that, um, yeah, you know, the Bush administration was able to pass a bill, the the Medicare drug prescription benefit. The wait, is it Medicare or Medicaid? It's Medi- Medicare prescription drug. Medicare. Medicaid. Okay, I got that right. You know, which correct me if I'm wrong. Everyone agreed that was an absolute dog of a bill. Um, just in, uh, no. in, in terms of policy wonks no? agreed it was a terrible bill. Very popular. Yes, policy wonks agreed. But I mean, my very point is policy wonks. What? But very popular, and that's the thing. Okay, what but, the policy wonks think doesn't matter. What the voters think matters. Right. So I mean that. 
I guess that's the problem because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Policy wonks are relatively enthusiastic about this bill. Um, it's just the public isn't. Um, but I would. But depends I, the on reason policy I bring up, wonks. <laughs> that's depends true. On yes, which okay. side. Yeah. Um, but you know, one of the things that Katrina did, I think, was alter the perception both of the competency of the Bush administration and the sort of general for lack of a better way of putting it, faith in, in the, the capabilities of the American government to do something, um, the federal government to do something. And that was one of those moments where, you know, a lot of, of sort of resentment that had been building up sort of sub rosa against the Bush administration came into full flower. And Bush was never, in terms of his own popularity ratings, the same president after Katrina that he was before. Right. Um, and in some ways you can argue that the Obama administration – by either skill, will, or luck, has not had that moment yet. And this is this is the one area where I think they, they deserve a fair amount of credit. Most incoming administrations have major league fuck-ups in their first year in office. There is some foreign policy issue that they didn't anticipate was going to crop up. They bollocks up the handling of it, and it becomes a big thing that winds up you know alienating a lot of people. I, I'm not sure the Obama administration has had that. You know, maybe you can accuse them of, of, of dithering a little bit on Afghanistan, but I'm not, you know, the, the public opinion polls actually went in favor of Obama after he gave that speech. There has been no similar sort of thing like Somalia in, in 93 um, or the Bush administration's decision to pull out of Kyoto in 2000 uh, or in 2001 or 9-11 for that matter. You know, there has the China plane. Been, right, or the China plane thing. There, there has been no major gap. And, and Politically, that's a, that's not necessarily a great thing because you can't point to a deliverable there. But you know, from a policy perspective, I do think it's significant that they've actually managed not to have you know a, a sort of major disaster. And you know, as as someone who generally expects the worst, uh, uh, that that actually makes me happy. See, I might I might put it a different way. They haven't had okay. a major external disaster except the one they had you know the one they knew about when they came into office. But what yeah. they've done is they've um, to me when they came in position they thought they were, and they thought they were Roosevelt administration. Mm -hmm. um, and they did a bunch of things predicated on the belief that they were the Roosevelt administration that, I mean, their wounds right now are self-inflicted. They did the auto, mm -hmm. not entirely. Employment's not their fault. It has nothing to do no. with the president. You know, you can alleviate yeah. it, whatever, but the fact that unemployment is, but he did the auto bailout and it was a bad bailout. Yeah. No one likes it except in yeah. Michigan, right? And even in Michigan, it's not that popular. It was just a wildly right. unpopular thing to do. He did it. No president that I'm aware of has done something that stupid um, in their first year of office. They usually wait a couple of years before they do something that stupid. The pork, the, the, the stimulus bill, wildly mm -hmm. unpopular. Loaded with pork, mm -hmm. backloaded so that you didn't get any jobs benefit, which is probably why they're gonna, they may lose the House next year. You didn't get any immediate jobs benefit. You, didn't get, right. you did not get immediate jobs benefit. You're going to get some yeah. eventually because, you know, um, you're going to get a boost to GDP eventually. But they backloaded it. Right. And they backloaded it because they didn't want to do stimulus. They wanted to do handouts to their various constituencies. And they thought that by doing this, they thought that they weren't spending political capital. They thought they were building up their political capital. Earning it. It was a phenomenally mm -hmm. dumb move. And Obama, mm -hmm. the, as far as I can tell, the Obama administration was in behind a lot of it, and riding along happily for the rest of it. Those were two huge political missteps that have cost them dramatically. And it made it harder to do health care. It's made it harder to do everything because, frankly, people don't trust them anymore. They see mm -hmm. a lot of people see them. And, again, with, they've not done anything. They have done things on financial regulation. And I actually think they need – they should get more slack than they have for doing things slowly. It's okay to have financial regulation yeah. that comes three years after. It doesn't have to happen immediately. We're not going to have another financial crisis in the next two years. Um, As that, did you see, I know Schreiber had a pretty good piece, I thought, today in the New Republic about the, the, the stress test and that it actually was a pretty good policy outcome as far as things go. But the fact is that the way you, the way you fix a financial system is by injecting capital into the, holder, into the holders of long assets, who are the banks. There's no way right. to bail out a financial crisis without doing that, as Brad DeLong once said to me. The problem with that mm -hmm. is that it looked like giving away stuff to it looks like It looks like a bailout. It looks yeah. like a bailout. This is what bailouts look like. And people can't see. Yeah. There's no People don't understand that the counterfactual is if you don't bail out these banks, the Great Depression was just unbelievably awful. And that, right. you know, we probably weren't going to get there, but we could have gotten something very close to there. Um, mm -hmm. we didn't, there were some institutional blocks like the FDIC that meant it was never going to get that bad, but it could have gotten way worse than it did, but no one can see that. Yes. And so 
they, they, they and already the, knew they I mean, had to do things that were going to be unpopular, and they did a bunch of other things not realizing that they were going to be unpopular, even though the opposition to the stimulus, the first Bush stimulus, should have told them that it was going to be. That had already been really contentious. The Republicans were yeah. already getting points, scoring points with their constituents and with Democrats for having mm-hmm. voted against it. And they went ahead and did it anyway because they thought they knew better. And so, you know, I'd like... Yes, they didn't have an external thing, but they really screwed up the politics on two of the major things they've done. But sorry, I keep interrupting yeah. you. you. You should talk. No, no, no. It's, it's okay. The, I mean, I, you know, I, I paid less attention to the domestic politics, obviously, right. but I don't necessarily disagree with your assessment. I think the one, you know, if, if I was going to voice what the Obama administration is thinking, my hunch is they're, the way they're trying to game this is that they, they don't so much care where they are now. They care where they're going to look like in November of 2010 and then November of 2012. And I think their hope is, is that, you know, the situation, I think they knew this, you know, economically, this was just going to be a, a horrible year. It just didn't matter. Um, I think what their hope is, and it'll be interesting to see going forward, is to whether or not, you know, in a, a year from now or whether, you know, eight months from now, the economy is looking in a much better situation than it is now. I now, think, whether that's the case or not is not clear, but I think that was what their thinking was. My my thing about that, though, is that I think that, for example, employment's just not going to recover. And I know that there's some Democratic strategists who think that it will, but I think they're just dramatically misevaluating. They're basically mm-hmm. comparing this to the 1980 recession. But that was mm-hmm. a very, very special recession that had to do with Paul Volcker rashing up interest rates to 20% and then right. undoing that really quickly. Um, and this is a totally different kind of recession. There's a lot of structural change going on in the economy where you're not going to, employment's just not going to recover by next year. Like, you know, maybe, because it, it just takes a while to generate the kind of economic growth that would be yeah. needed to get unemployment down. So that means the next year they're going to be headed into the election facing these problems. And now, economically, as a writer, I would... I don't want to see them just randomly pick up a stick and start whacking the banks because I think that you can get really terrible unintended consequences from doing that. I want to see them yeah. moving slowly and thoughtfully. But politically, if I were Rahm Emanuel, I would be looking would for the biggest stick the I banks. could find and whack, start yeah. whacking the banks because that, above everything else, is just hugely, hugely contentious. And I, I totally understand why. We gave these guys billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, and they pay themselves gigantic bonuses, and we don't even get, like, a, a goddamn fruit basket. Nothing. Not even, like, a, a thank you card at Christmas, right? They, 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 seem to be, they seem to feel that they were totally entitled to get this bailout and that they should, yeah. therefore, pay their employees this gargantuan sum of money. It's totally, you know, Main Street is justifiably enraged. Um, yeah. And I would, be, I, would, I would already have whacked them more than, mm-hmm. more than they have been whacked. Um, because politically, um, and also pour encourager les autres. Um, I mean, I think like the fact is that, uh, sorry for anyone who actually speaks French. My French is absolutely appalling. Um, oh God, but, I thought that was Russian. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> and deepest apologies to Madame Goldstein, who's, who spent six years trying to pound enough French in my head to, uh, order mm-hmm. a croissant in Paris. Um, but sorry, neither here nor there, I digress. Um, I, I think that even though a lot of the things that you could do to whack the banks would in fact be counterproductive and not good for the financial system, they would also have a healthy element of eliminating some of the massive moral hazard that we've engendered in the last year and a half. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, so we've got, uh, we've got the financial crisis, the auto bailouts, yeah. uh, I think were bad policy, bad uh, economics and uh, likely to haunt the Obama administration. I give him an F on the auto bailouts. Um, mm-hmm. Both bad optics and bad uh, and bad economics. Um, I give them. I, I'm against the health care bill, so you know I, I give them politically like a B B plus for the health care mm-hmm. bill. Uh, but I give them. You know I, I don't like the bill. I don't think anyone really does. You said that about Wonks. They don't actually like the bill. They just think that if they enact the bill, they'll be able to go and do a bunch of other stuff later that it's the mm-hmm. camel's nose under the tent. I don't know anyone who actually mm-hmm. thinks, like, this is a great health care bill and exactly what I wanted to end up with. Um, oh, no, I agree with that. I, I think the point was was that, on the whole, there, most of the wonks are not, I would say most of the wonks are not bitterly opposed to the bill. Well, I think Even that, the wonks, go ahead. I think that you've got these, you've got the four pillars that, that wonks basically favor, which is Romney care. It's a Massachusetts plan, basically. 
It's the mm-hmm. community rating, guaranteed issue, subsidies, um, and a mandated minimum benefit package. The problem yeah. is that then all of the details are screwed up. Like the way they're paying mm-hmm. for it is this bizarre combination of this excise tax that raises money through this incredibly complicated Rube Goldberg apparatus that can be shut down if any of the steps doesn't work out exactly as predicted. Um, and all of the other elements, you know, that have to do with um, just, it, it's all of the little details are all weird. And the, so many of them represent sort of handouts to various constituencies more than half. The weird thing is that the parts that people like are this guaranteed issue, et cetera, have nothing to do with what's going to happen to most people. The bulk of the yeah. expansion is Medicaid expansion. And Medicaid, everyone right. agrees, is a terrible program. It's horrible. Mm-hmm. It's not good. For, it, it, provide, it gets subpar outcomes. There are studies that actually find that it is safer to be uninsured than to have Medicare, Medicaid. You have a higher relative risk of dying on Medicaid than you do if you have no insurance whatsoever. Um, okay. I don't know that I, I would, I, I'm not going to vouch for those results, but you know, that, that moving from being uninsured to having Medicaid is not unambiguously, um, terrific, but that's where most of the expansion is done because it's cheap because the Medicaid reimbursement rates are too low. Um, yeah. so the only people who are willing to accept it are teaching hospitals who use basically poor people as, you know, teaching dummies for their patients and Medicaid mills that are widely believed to to only be sustainable because they commit fairly massive fraud. Um, so this is a terrible program, and that is where we do most of the expansion. The rest of it is, huh, I don't want to say it's window dressing, but it's mm-hmm. really mostly beside the point. And if you had said to people, like, let's do this big Medicaid expansion, they would be way less enthusiastic because Medicaid isn't, yeah. isn't a good program. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the extent to which they're excited is really the extent to which they think that they're going to be able to take the other part of it and expand that and force on more and more people until basically that is the insurance market in the United States. Um, obviously, libertarian, I have issues with this uh, on many levels. Yeah. But, uh, um, so so know, I, I, I don't I, know. But this actually raises, I mean, this is a good way to close, I think, which is, you know, the decade I don't think you would characterize has been terribly kind to libertarians in terms of, of the way events have played themselves out. Um, to what extent, you know, I guess, I guess my question is to what extent now do you believe things differently than you believed 10 years ago in terms of the way markets work and the proper role of governments in the marketplace? Or have you not changed your mind on these things? Oh, I've, I've changed my mind. I don't know if it's the decade so much as just that you get older and, you know, I, I hope people change their minds, right? If, mm-hmm. if, if everything that I knew at the age of 28 was perfect, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, either I would be perfect or I'd be incredibly pig-headed and unable to learn from reading and experience. I would right. say the biggest change that I've had, it's actually quite interesting because I'm now involved in this lengthy dispute over whether it's okay to walk away from your mortgage if you can pay it. I'm totally right. in favor of easy bankruptcy and, mm-hmm. you know, kind foreclosure terms, et cetera. I think non-recourse loans are in general a good thing um, for people who can't pay. For people mm-hmm. who can, I think you shouldn't. I think that the social norm that you try to pay your obligations as long as you can um, and obviously can is a term of art and, you know, we can argue about yeah. in any, any individual circumstance, but in the particular circumstance that I've been arguing about was a wall street journal article about someone who, you know, stopped paying her, her mortgage, lived rent free for two years, spent the money on cruises and new dining room furniture before she finally handed the, the um, the keys over to the bank. And I don't think yeah. that this is a good person. Um, or I, I don't think this is a person who's acting like a good person whether or not right. whatever has happening in her heart of hearts, that is not a moral thing to do. And there's a bunch of people who've been saying, well, but the contract says you can do that. Mm-hmm. And this is weird to me because this is such like a mind, the kind of thing that these are all liberals, the kind of thing that liberals are always excoriating libertarians for saying this mindless homo economicus, you know, yeah. rational value maximizer. And the fact is what I've come to appreciate more and more and more mm-hmm. is how little of um, markets are made up by the explicit rules. By contract, how much yeah, they... of society is just governed by these hidden norms. And in yeah. a lot of ways, they're arbitrary. Things like... I, the, social, I, the, so, the social embeddedness of markets. Exactly. And so yeah. the thing is, the reason that we can have easy bankruptcy and non-recourse loans is that most people try to pay their loans back. And so the liberals mm-hmm. who are saying, well, you know, banks are bad, it should be okay to do this, 
they're not taking it to the next step, which is what would the system look like? Yeah. Would it be easy for these right. people to walk away? No, it would not, because the rules would have been changed so that yes. anyone who walked away would face punitive consequences. And the problem with that, right, is that then everyone would get punished, including the people who really can't pay. So for me, mm-hmm. the, the system we have now allows us to distinguish the people who really can't pay and the people who can. People who really can't pay will, after they've gotten over the social shame, they will do what they have to do. And then people will, knowing their circumstances, not entirely, but largely say, ah, yes, well, you couldn't pay. You, you were totally right to declare bankruptcy in that situation. If you take that away, then the rules are going to be everyone, and as they are in a lot of countries, anyone who defaults on their debt gets screwed. And then, you know, the people who genuinely can't pay are worse off. The people who can pay are a little better off. But those aren't the people I want Mm -hmm. to make better off. I want to make the people better off who really need to shed their past debts because they're now become this anvil around their neck. Um, And so just more broadly, though, the the development economics especially, that that, that markets are socially embedded um, and that you you can't just talk about what explicit rules you're going to make because – you, you almost can't even see all of the hidden rules that govern whether these things are going to work or not. And I think the, the classic example is shock therapy in Russia, right? Um, it always kind of reminds me of Richard Feynman talking about cargo cult science, where these, uh, right. these islanders in the Pacific built perfect, not perfect, but they built replicas of the U.S. communications huts. And they would sit there mm-hmm. and they would, you know, they, would, they had coconut uh, headphones of their ears and so things, forth, yeah, yeah. trying to get the planes to land. But of course, they didn't understand there was a big missing element. And to me, yeah. that's what we did to Russia. We put all of the rules in place to have a market, but the social embedded functions weren't there. And so it ended up going horribly wrong. Um, mm-hmm. And so that kind of idea that, oh, we should just hew perfectly to these legalistic rules, it just doesn't work. It's not even... It's not even a, an ideological question. You cannot set up a system that way. No system and the history of the planet has ever run that way. And so I think in a lot of ways, you know, and and things like what I thought about was going to happen in Iraq, you know, or what Mm -hmm. I thought Saddam Hussein was doing. Um, Mm -hmm. I just kind of sat around and imagined this fairly simple thought experiment where I was Saddam Hussein and he was acting like someone who had WMD. He was acting like me. He was acting like I would act if I had weapons of mass destruction. So therefore he must have weapons of mass destruction. But of course I was missing a bunch of information. Um, I'm just trying to picture a world where Megan has weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> it would be a terrifying world, although I would get excellent customer service from all of my air repl- uh, appliance <laughs> repairmen. Um, <laughs> so I think that there okay. is this tendency in both right and left to just kind of sit and do thought experiments where you imagine what the world would be like if everyone were just like you. And you set up mm. these simple rules. And, um, and so... Like that—that that is the biggest thing that I've changed. I'm certainly, I'm less ideological than I was ten years ago. I think um, I am more prone. I'm squishier, um, mm-hmm. but I think that that's because I never liked Ayn Rand. But the main problem: the people in her novels don't act like any human being anywhere has ever acted. And I think that sort of gives you the core to not just right wing, but also a lot of problems with left wing ideology, where you imagine the new Soviet man or the new capitalist man. Um, yeah. and you, you leave out a bunch of important human characteristics. What about you? What are, what are, how have you changed over the last decade? I, I mean, in some ways I can give a similar answer, which is, a, you know, it's just a greater appreciation for the complexity of, of, uh, uh, of global, uh, of globalization. I think, you know, the ways in which, for example, layman's collapse back in the fall of 2008, the unanticipated effects that had, um, on markets in that it led to the reserve primary fund breaking the the buck, and then that led to you know a, a sort of cascade effect where markets nearly melted down. I think the, the, my favorite book this year um, was uh, um, Aaron Ross Sorkin's Too Big to Fail, and the book was tremendous to me in that it actually rereading it, it 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 was the, the closest thing I've got to remembering what it was like in the fall of two thousand eight. And you know, I actually had a greater degree of sympathy for you know guys like Bernanke and Paulson and, and Geithner after reading it because it was clear that things were hitting them so fast that it was simply impossible for them to sort of game out exactly what the implications of each possible policy move was. Um, and so it's made me much more cautious in terms of, of making sort of broad, uh, both making broad pronouncements about the way the world works, I guess, but also any kind of broad reform program to fix the way the world works. 
because I'm pretty sure the unanticipated effects of those broad reform programs are, you know, going to be pretty massive. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think I just hopefully more humbled, uh, more humbled in terms of my policy pronouncements than I used to be. Yeah, I think my, um, my, my, my current motto is it's complicated. If my life were a Facebook yeah. status, it would be it's complicated. That's, that's basically now Great. my governing philosophy. We should actually probably close um, by doing a couple predictions for the new year. Um, if you have, if you have um, okay, minute. my pr- <laughs> sure, yeah. My, my prediction for the new year is that uh, in December 2010, we're going to be talking a lot about Sudan. Really? Um, Sudan's going to, yeah. So I, I think South Sudan's going to blow up. There's supposed to be a referendum that's held. There's a lot of oil down there. Um, it, it's And as a result, China's very interested. Um, I, I, it would not shock me at all if we're talking about some peacekeeping mission in Sudan. Uh, my prediction for the new year is that the Democrats lose the House in 2010. Uh, my other, my prediction for the new decade is that the United States, the run of the United States as the world's economic uh, superpower and the engine of, uh, of the global economy is not yet over. And that when the dust clears in, in two or three or four years, uh, the United States will once again be back as uh, the having the most attractive combination of growth and uh, um, of growth and size and stability mm-hmm. uh, in the world. I hope you're right on that. Uh, me too. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, this was a lot of fun, Megan, and have a great 2010. Farewell, Internet. And uh, here's hoping that 2010 is better than 2009 was because we all sure deserve it. Amen. Amen. Peace on earth, good will to man. Peace out. Bye.